Welcome to another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, and I'm here at the News Forum where all voices matter. We have a special election edition of our monthly panel. It's a perfect time to discuss the issues with our steady hands, plus a newcomer. As Sandra Pupatello finds herself on the campaign trail, we're pleased to welcome the first of several substitutions. The Honorable Christian Paradis joins us from Montreal. He's a former industry minister, my successor in the Harper government. As always, we're pleased to welcome back former finance minister Joe Oliver, plus former Alberta cabinet minister and now head of the Canada West Foundation, Gary Marr. Welcome to you all. Thanks for having us, Tony. Uh, Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll ask our guest first, because that would be the polite thing to do, and we are always a polite show. Uh, Christian Paradis, what is your assessment of the first three weeks of the election campaign? Uh, we see here, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Ho Tool, he, he, he made a plan, he works his plan, is doing good. I think Mr. Trudeau looks like someone who lost his guidances. And we see also um, Yves-François Blanchet from the Bloc. He's on a very defensive way. It seems to be hard for him. And the NDP is just, you know, they're, they're there. Uh, it's, it's not too bad, but uh, they, they are still very abstract. So this is what we see here in Quebec for now. And I'll, I want to drill down on some of those issues. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that, Christian. Joe Oliver from your perch in Ontario. What's your assessment of the first three weeks? Well, it's pretty clear that the Conservatives have uh, the momentum. Uh, the, the Liberals have been running a pretty bad campaign, which is surprising for two, for two reasons. One, they, they tend to be very good at this sort of stuff. And secondly, uh, they seem surprised uh, and, uh, at, at an election that they themselves called. They, they seemed uh, really unready for it. Uh, finally, today, uh, we, we get their their platform, but it's been a, a whole series of self-inflicted uh, wounds, starting, of course, with the fact that they actually call the election during a surging uh, fourth uh, wave of the pandemic and the day that Kabul fell. And, uh, you know, we can get into to, to those issues, but a lot of, uh, a lot of Canadians, uh, certainly in Ontario and, and West, feel this is an unnecessary uh, election, putting them in, in danger, and it's basically a vanity project uh, for the Prime Minister to increase his power and reduce his accountability. And to do that, uh, at the same time, they failed so colossally in fulfilling their, their obligations to, to our, our friends and allies in, in Afghanistan, and particularly women and girls, is, uh, um, you know, is something I, I think uh, resonating very badly. Uh, for the Liberals. Uh, Gary Marr, uh, I, I just want to add uh, and, and agree with Joe uh, that, uh, of course, uh, calling the election, being seen as calling it a necessary election in the, in the middle of a fourth wave pandemic, uh, it, it, that, that uh, decision hasn't gone away. We're still, we're three weeks in now and people are still talking about it. What, what's your perspective from Alberta? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, Aaron O'Toole had a very good start to his campaign because the putting his platform out there on day two, I think, was a, a good uh, tactic because it allows uh, him to define himself as opposed to uh, previous campaigns where the Liberals tried to um, tried to define Andrew Scheer and uh, fight a campaign against uh, Stephen Harper, who wasn't even on the ballot. So I think... <laughs> was a very good tactical move on the part of Mr. O'Toole. Um, I agree that uh, the Liberals seem to have caught themselves by surprise in terms of this election. I don't think that calling an unnecessary election uh, by itself uh, is a big issue, but you've got to be able to define uh, what it is that you're going to stand for. I think John Horgan did a pretty good job of that, uh, calling an election uh, sort of two years into a mandate uh, to get a majority in the province of British Columbia, compare that to the experience of um, Premier Rankin in Nova Scotia, where he was not able to uh, identify a good reason to call an election in the middle of a COVID campaign. And I, uh, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, so far, the Liberal campaign federally looks more like uh, Premier Rankin than Premier Horgan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good point. And I, I do want to get into, maybe we'll do this after the break. We've only got a, a few seconds left before the break. And uh, obviously, I want to hear from you about 
what sort of policies or issues are standing out uh, now that we're into week three of the campaign. But that's an important topic, and so I don't want to give anybody uh, a shortened period to answer that. We'll tackle that subject after the break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. And we're back here at Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, with our monthly panel. And we have subbing in for Sandra Pupatello, Mr. Christian Paradis, the Honorable Christian Paradis, a former industry minister, along with uh, the Honorable Joe Oliver, of course, former finance minister, and Gary Marr, head of the Canada West Foundation. Uh, Gary, maybe start with you. Any policies or issues jump out at you? Obviously, we have the various campaigns driving their messages of the day and so on. Has anything really stuck uh, in terms of uh, being one of the defining issues of the campaign in your estimation? Uh, you know, I've gone through the uh, the conservative uh, platform. It's 45,000 words, 160 pages. Uh, it looks like a credible document. It remains to be costed out yet, but I'm certain that the campaign plans to do that. I haven't had the chance to uh, do the same with either the Liberal or the NDP plat platforms. But uh, I would say that um, one of the defining issues is the ability to deliver on rhetoric. And, uh, you know, Joe talked about the uh, situation in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that uh, if you think about all the things that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had said he stood up for, uh, he has not been able to deliver um, and breathe life into the ambitions that he's expressed in, in his rhetoric. Uh, Christian Paradis, any big issues from your point of view? Yes, of course. Um, I think now uh, um, what I hear, uh, I intended the uh, the conservative rally last weekend just to see and uh, from the ground what people hear. And they and they said, look, we we've been hearing a lot that people are not happy with uh, with Prime Minister Trudeau on many issues, and then going with a snap election like that, it does exacerbate right in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, but now what is interesting is that people uh, begin to see that there, there might be a, another alternative. And this is where uh, Aaron O'Toole's come at play. Uh, with his plan, with his detailed plan, I think he, he succeeded to, to define himself. He will have some, some big issues to watch, Joe, be, because it will be, you know, the environment is a, is a wedge issue for sure here. So he'll have to define correctly his platform. Uh, also, social issues. Uh, he he needs to not commit the same mistake that was done from uh, Mr. Shear. So he has to be cl crystal clear and explain uh, what the position is and so on and so forth. Uh, there is also a big deal here about child care. There was a big um, a big agreement signed with the uh, provincial government, and of course, it may be atypical, but it will have to uh, clarify wh where he stands on that because right. the uh, the infrastructure is not the same nationally speaking. And um, so uh, I would say that in general, uh, and you know, it's always like that in Quebec. You never know where the where the vote will go, but you you can see that you know there is a tendency here. Frankly, the conservatives have the momentum, but we could see uh, big majorities in the 80s with the liberals, big majority in the 90s with the conservative. Then after that, the bloc came in. And you know, in the beginning of the uh, 2010s and 2011, we thought that we 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 uh, we might be um, uh, able to do something. And then at the sudden, the block collapsed. But it went to the NDP. But right. this time, I think uh, you know uh, the the emphasis should sh should be put on the fact that the NDP their platform may be attractive but abstract. So I, I think this is where they will need to play. But I see also that the NDP now this time is wise. So instead of trying to attack the conservative and solidify the liberal vote, they, they tend to uh, attack the liberal uh, yeah. vote. So to, so to make sure that it doesn't split. And then after that, uh, you know, they don't want uh, the liberals to uh, secure their base. So we can see that it will be a very astute war here, uh, astute combat. And uh, something to watch also, as I said, Yves-François Blanchet is a good debater, but now he's on a clear defensive way. He made a big mistake by, uh, by uh, blocking a candidate to express herself yesterday in Sherbrooke. Very, mm. very bad looking. So just, you know, I, I will finish up here, but I think the real day for Mr. O'Toole is tomorrow, the first French debate. Uh, I think he, he uh, you know, uh, for now he's been surprising a lot. He speaks more French than people think. And I think the real campaign will begin here in Quebec because so far uh, the polls didn't move a lot. 
so far, but it will be interesting to watch in the next coming weeks. But it starts tomorrow with this debate. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's where things started to fall apart for Andrew Scheer two years ago uh, with exactly. a poor performance in the French language debate. So that's a, we've got about 30 seconds left, so I'm going to defer Joe until the next round. But Christian, uh, your point is the French language debate in Quebec, very, very key. It is. And the same thing uh, back in 2011 uh, with Jack Layton and Gilles Dissip was very arrogant. He said to Jack Layton, you'll never be prime minister, neither do I. But I don't say that. And, uh, and, and, and you should say that because, you know, so d people didn't like the fact that uh, Gilles Dissip was basically uh, saying that Jack Layton was a liar. And he said he could be t uh, technically prime minister. So you can see the vote going there massively with the NDP. So you never know. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with our monthly panel, including Christian Paradis, former industry minister. But uh, it's Joe Oliver who has the floor. He's been waiting patiently. And Joe, I'd love to get your point of view on what you see as the, the major issues that have unfolded. And maybe also take a, since Christian gave us a great uh, tour of what's going on in Quebec, maybe give us uh, your assessment of how things are going in Ontario. Sure. I mean, the the issue is, is there a, a valid question? And I'm not sure that there really is. You know, you, you listen to the, to the pollsters and they say, you know, right on top is, is climate change and health. Well, um, try as the liberals might, uh, they, they can't seem to uh, get a, a huge difference between the policies of, of the two parties. There are, there are some, but it's not, uh, it's not stark. And, um, you know, as Christian said, uh, it was absolutely critical for Aaron O'Toole to define himself early. He, you know, people would say, well, he hasn't been out there. Of course, he was out there all the time. It's just the press wasn't, wasn't reporting it. And now, of course, uh, they are. And uh, the fact that he was, was out there defining himself as, as a moderate, as someone who's competent, someone who cares, Mr. Canada with a smile, uh, that, is, uh, uh, th that has been, been very important in creating the alternative uh, to uh, to to the liberals who are and and to the to the prime minister who is uh, obviously declining in, in public uh, support uh, it seems by the day uh, but uh, you know and we always say that uh, that ele elections uh, you know aren't won by the opposition rather uh, the governments defeat themselves but even if they're in the process of doing that there has to be an alternative and and. Um, and Aaron O'Toole is, is presenting himself that way. One, one of the issues which the pollsters don't seem to talk about, but it seems to me is pretty damn important, and that is uh, people's standard of living and, 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 and the, their ability uh, to, to, uh, to actually pay the, the essentials, to, to pay for food, to pay for, for, for lodgings, to, uh, to maintain their standard of living. And what we have now is a, a, a resurgence of inflation, and people are, are quite worried about uh, pocketbook issues, I think, in a way that, that may be underestimated. And, and here you get into the, to the broad issue of who's able to, to be competent enough uh, to deal with those, uh, those critical uh, economic issues. And I think in that regard, um, all the polls that I've seen suggest that, uh, that Aaron O'Toole creates a higher degree of confidence. And, and traditionally, uh, the Conservatives have as well, but, but that issue wasn't quite as, as, as in, in the front of, of things as I think it now is as we, as we gradually emerge from, emerge from the, the recession and a lot of the, um, uh, the, the support programs are going to be gone. So, so people are going to be very concerned about where the economy is going and, uh, mm -hmm. and even issues right. of debt, which I'm concerned about, but, but I keep being told uh, no one else is. Well, um, you know, I, I think people... You may be just slightly ahead of your time, Joe. I, I, I may be a lot ahead of my time in that regard, <laughs> but, but I, do, I do think that people understand uh, affordability. And uh, I, I, I just think uh, the, the inflation numbers, and now actually we're in stagflation. I mean, the, the economy, um, you know, fell in, in the last quarter and inflation rose to, uh, to 3.7%. 
uh, that, that's not a, a great backdrop uh, for the uh, governing party. Uh, Gary Marr, we've got just uh, over a minute left in this segment, but uh, I'm curious to know what your assessment is in Alberta of some of these other parties like the uh, People's Party of Canada and the, the kind of the Western alienation vote. Is that going to be a big factor, do you think, at the end of the day? Those, uh, those parties from all the polls that I've seen are uh, like the Maverick Party and the People's uh, Party. Uh, they appear to be in uh, sort of single digit numbers. I, I don't think that there's any um, conservative members of parliament who are incumbents who are lying awake at night uh, being concerned about that. Uh, the, uh, the numbers in Alberta that I've seen is that support for the Conservative Party is you know, somewhere around 56%. And there are other, there are ridings within where it'd be probably closer to 80 or 85 percent. It's a similar situation in the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, there are pockets of uh, people in uh, Manitoba and, and, and you know, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan that may be inclined to vote liberal. Uh, but I don't think that it's going to be uh, significant uh, in terms of turnout for uh, for liberals. We're going to have to take a brief break, but we'll be back with our panel. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. Uh, here with our monthly panel, the Honorable Christian Paradis is subbing in. He's a former industry minister as well as Joe Oliver, former finance minister, Gary Marr, former Alberta cabinet minister as well as head of the Canada West Foundation. Uh, Christian, I, I'm, I'm just interested in how uh, uh, Aaron O'Toole's personality plays out in the province of Quebec. Uh, he is clearly running a campaign, a positive campaign, uh, not trying to be too negative, uh, but at the same time, he's got this military background, so he can be someone who could be automatically seen as perhaps a leader. Give, it, give us your sense, because Quebecers sometimes view our leaders in, in different ways than the rest of the country. Yes, I would say like a month ago, nobody knew who, uh, who Aaron Otto was. And now more and more people are paying attention. I, I, and as I said tomorrow, that will be the real start. But uh, so far, so good. He's done well. Uh, he looks very sympathetic. He's surprised with his uh, high level of French. And also what he did, he, uh, he was quick to answer the uh, famous uh, uh, request from the government of Quebec. And as I said earlier, uh, outside the island of Montreal, where it's always liberals, or uh, when you go outside, you never know what can happen. And back in uh, 2018, nobody would have predicted that uh, Lacac with Mr. Legault would go with a such tidal wave. So now they, uh, they are aligned, uh, definitely. Uh, Mr. Trudeau is, uh, is arguing against Mr. Legault about the, uh, about the, uh, about the jurisdiction. And the bloc now they try to get to be pertinent. They are talking about their uh, their, um, their their identity bill and so on and so forth. But it it looks irrelevant because Mr. O'Toole with his platform addressed all of this, and he's quite clear is uh, clearly uh, clearly aligned with Mr. Legault. So as I said earlier, if he can go over and reassure about the other issues such as environment, social issues, and then go back in the economy where he's very solid plus the uh, nationalist aspect about getting a good uh, relationship with the most popular government in Canada, which is Mr. Legault's one. I think it could be on a very solid track. Interesting. Uh, Joe Oliver, uh, two years ago, uh, Doug Ford wasn't very popular in Ontario and basically he was uh, advised by the federal party under Andrew Scheer to stay locked up in his basement for the duration of the, of the campaign because they thought it was gonna hurt the federal conservative campaign this time. Uh, Doug Ford is, is relatively popular. Uh, he's bounced back from his uh, low polling numbers uh, and, uh, and is exercising leadership in the province and yet has decided not to play an overt role in the election campaign. Can you analyze that a little bit for us in the, in the minute and a half we have, about, we have left? Well, sure. I, look, this is, a, this is a, an alleged agreement uh, that is clearly to uh, to uh, Justin Trudeau's advantage, because I don't think he wants to get into a big fight with the Premier of, of Ontario, who, as you say, has a pretty good uh, level of, of uh, credibility uh, right now. So, um, you know, from his point of view, it makes sense. Although today, uh, the Premier was quick to point out uh, or to reiterate the fact he thought the election was totally uh, useless. 
he, he did he did say that, but he's instructed his cabinet ministers not to to engage in the campaign. Um, whether there was some deal that that down the road, if if uh, the liberals get reelected, uh, they won't intervene in the provincial election. I, I don't know. Um, you know what what the the quid pro quo for for the premier was, but you know um, it does raise the issue of of what where the liberals are, are going here in in what what looks like a lot of flailing around and a bit of uh, of, of, uh, of if not desperation certainly some worry and what they what they did in the last election as we know was turn negative halfway right. through and that negativity was was actually very effective. I mean, they talked about how important it was not to be, but that's, in fact, what they were. But they got away with it because they were able to accuse uh, Andrew Scheer of all sorts of things, uh, which I don't think were, were actually accurate, but they sort of stuck because he is a social conservative, even though he wouldn't have imposed those views on, on the government. Well, you know, uh, uh, Errol Tool is yeah. not. Yeah. And, and so the, these attacks are not resonating, and that's frankly um, hurting, hurting the party. We're going to have to take it up next week uh, with Gary Marr and Joe Oliver. Thanks for stopping by. Gary, I'll give you first dibs next week. Christian Paradis, it's great to have you as a guest appearance. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Very interesting. Thank you. We'd like to thank our guests. The panel will be back next week for another special election edition with another uh, special guest. Stay tuned for that, but thanks for watching today.